every generation comes along a sci-fi movie so magical, so beautiful, and so spicy that it reshapes the genre, and takes cinema to a place no man, no woman, and no non-binary has gone before. In 1968, it was 2001. In 1982, Blade Runner. In 2017, The Last Jedi. Now in 2024, we have Dune Part 2, the greatest sci-fi ever. Almost. Here is the good, the bad, and the nearly of the greatest near-miss in sci-fi cinematic history. The story of Dune is simple. Star Drug Wars. A space spice boy is the chosen one, the Mardi. Born to a leader who doesn't want to lead. A great man doesn't seek to lead. And a mother who sounds like Linda Blair. <laughs> Paul Atreides is caught between a rock and a desert place. What is his dream? A girl on Arrakis. And there is no man who won't withstand some sand to pound Luke's man or a spider mom. Like the Dark One, Messiah Paul's mom is all that matters. You inherit too much power. Not because I'm a Duke's son. Because you are Jessica's son. Papa Atreides. I should have married you. Let this be a lesson to all men with commitment issues. The houses are at war for a barren planet, a desert rock, a spicy space meatball filled with worms. What could the house of Atreides and Harkonnen possibly want with this much sand? Drugs. This sand is no ordinary sand, it's sand that'll get you higher than a kite on Jupiter. Not only will it turn your eyes blue and make you cuckoo, it'll fuel your spaceships from Orion to Oblivion. Spice is the hottest commodity in the universe, but it's only found on the hottest rock, and every house wants a piece of the pie to get high. Enter the villains. My desert, my Arrakis, my doom. The most brutal, barbaric, and bloodlusting bastards ever seen on screen. These baked bean-headed white boys are whiter than sunlight and darker than a hotel inside a black hole. Baron Harkonnen, a psychotic Pavarotti, has one note, one goal, destroy all the Atreides and take all the blow. Planet Arrakis becomes festered with Uncle Festers. The spice is now in the hands, the white hands of violent white male colonialists. Dunes part one and part two deal with dark themes, but there is one theme in number two that rises from the sand like an erect statue. Men killing women. The Harkonnen slaughter girls like they are trying to score points in a Jack the Ripper arcade game. Almost every scene involves a woman losing her life to a Harkonnen knife. These villains are not just murderous, they are misogynist, a metaphor for man. Give them too much power and they'll turn women into fertilizer. No feminine flower can grow in a world that looks like snow. On Arrakis, the Fremen are not free. They live under tyranny and attack the Harkonnen from their dune sanctuary. Unlike the hate-filled pale white Harkonnens, they are desert people who drink their own pee and wonder if he really is the chosen one. Their society is not built on barbarism, but on beautiful feminism. As Zendaya tells Paul, Here we are equal, men and women alike. His reply, I'd very much like to be equal to you. A point that is hammered home at every available opportunity. The houses of Atreides and Harkonnen are majestic homes of white male privilege. Caladan, don't expect more than a cameo unless you're a man. Gady Prime, bald and white, like Walter White. The world of Arrakis is an awakening to Paul. The hierarchy is a matriarchy. The men are not masters, they are soldiers and the women are on top. Throughout Dune Part 2, Paul falls foul of his sexist past and must change his ways. In one thoroughly shocking scene, Zendaya tries to teach Paul how to dance along the desert without waking the Sand Beast. Instead of listening to the woman who has lived her entire life on Arrakis, he immediately cuts her off. Now that's interesting, because in the film books I've studied, what did you just say? Paul ain't the messiah, he's a very naughty mansplainer. The water of life, birthed from the babies of sandworms, it is a magical potion that grants Syracuse women, and women only, the memories of their female ancestors. Any drinks on the menu for the boys? Sorry chaps, the bar is closed, for your memories are a blackout. Paul's mother Jessica downs her shot, and the weirding woman gets even weirder. 
Now she has the weird ability to speak with her unborn baby daughter, who wastes no time in barking orders at Paul from the womb. I'm gonna show you what real women do, so you don't know what real mother women do. Should a man ever drink the woman's drink and... The Fremen believe Paul is the one to free them, but to do so he must free his mind and fulfill his prophecy. Like Arthur and Excalibur, Cinderella and a Slipper, Destiny calls for the Moadi, the Messiah, to drink the drink that can kill any man, but never a woman. So he does, and instantly falls into a coma. A man's mind, even a messiah's, is far too weak to handle a woman's drink. The only thing that can save him now, no, not having his stomach pumped, but a single tear from the woman he loves rubbed onto his lips. A beautiful ode to Romeo and Juliet, although in this one they both live, and Juliet regrets it. What is Paul's new superpower? Can he speak to unborn babies, see three minutes into the future, raise an army from the dead? Not quite, for Paul has the special ability to... Uh, to find out who his real granddad is. Ah, uh, well, so who is it? A famous poet? A man who snorted more spice than Keith Richards? I am your grandfather. What the f- that's right, somehow the sperm of this white male sperm whale produced Rebecca Ferguson and Timothy Chalamet. Science fiction is fiction, but that may be one fictitious step too far. One would expect his daughter to look more like this. Dude has perfect villains, strong women, and weak men, but there is one serious problem. One fatal flaw. Throughout part two, the Fremen say it. Paul says it. Everyone watching knows it. In the age of modern enlightenment, why is the Mardi still an off-world white man? Why not a woman born to Arrakis, or a non-binary born to binary sons? In 2024, this is frankly unacceptable. In part one, Denis Villeneuve had the nerve to light a Liet Kynes touch paper, but loses his nerve in part two. Paul is still a Paul when the world cried out for a Paula or is Zendaya, or any other woman, available for hire. The runtime of Dune Part 2 is 2 hours, 46 minutes, and the time just flies by. Probably because you've fallen asleep. At the end, there is one final twist. One last patriarchal punch to the kidneys. Blink and you'll miss it, if you're still blinking. Paul meets a little woman with a big dad, Emperor Shaddam, and Shazam, he tosses Zendaya in the trash faster than Dakota Johnson reading a review of Madame Webb. The girl of his dreams, the woman who taught him how to walk, binned for a bimbo who wears a hat like a metal tea cosy. One suspects Zendaya has shed her last tear for any man. Dune Part 2 is the greatest near miss in sci-fi cinematic history. The sand-based space drama could have ranked alongside true Criterion classics like The Terminator, Men in Black, and Star Wars. Instead, the Sands of Time will group it with Minority Report, a film with no minorities, The Thing, a film with no women, and Her, a film all about him. Lawrence of Arrakis thus has a rating of four and a half stars out of five, a near miss, but still worthy of a spicy trip to the theater. Over to you, Denis. Let's make history with Dune Part 3. Smile, Gurney. I am smiling. There is no call we do not answer. There is no faith that we betray. The guild does not take your order. 